Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get back into the subject temptation. Now, as I stated in the first part of uh, this lecture, that we can take one verse here and there that strengthens us when we feel a little bad. But the important thing is that you know how to fight, or I would prefer to use the word conquer, temptation. Christ is our example, and he set that example for us. When he himself was tempted, though he did not need to be tempted, he was perfect. We're not. He did this to show us how to overcome Satan uh, or anything negative in a sense, but you've got to do it his way. And the secret, it's all in God's word. It is written. And God's word strengthens you, and it takes the whole word whereby you are fortified. Uh, example, if you do not absorb God's word, and create that relationship between you and the Father for how do, you, how do you understand Him? From His Word, His commandments, His instructions. And within that, you receive God's blessings. And if you receive God's blessings abundantly, temptation is, has a, um, a difficult time coming against you. Uh, when you know and realize from God's word that it is his blessings, not some good time Charlie. But then having that uh, temptation, having that blessing, you must have God's word. The two go hand in hand. You must be pleasing to God or it's not going to fly. Well, Christ had uh, been in the wilderness 40 days and he hungered. He was hungry. But he conquered the flesh, and this is not that you're to try this, all right? It's not necessary. He, he set the example. And we discovered that in as much as he said, as it is written, man shall not live by bread alone in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, but by every word, I repeat, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you want to live and really live, uh, number one, the difference between living and not living is to have eternal life. Because if you do not have eternal life, you're really not living because you're going to be dead before long. Long gone, friend. Into the lake of fire. It's going to happen. That isn't a threat. It's just simply a fact. Okay, so with that having been said, let's pick it up then, if we may, in chapter 4, verse 5. The devil confronting Christ, tempting him. And this is what the devil says. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, just like many of God's election will be delivered up there, and setteth him on a pin pinnacle of the temple. I mean, we're, we're flying high here, friend. Six, and he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, and here of all people, Satan himself said, for it is written. Now that's really a laugh in a way, but it shows you Satan does know the word of God. There's just one problem. He twists just a little bit that that's written, enough to really throw you off if you listen to him through some of his teachers that delve into the traditions of men and Satan rather than sticking to every word of God. Got it? Okay. It is written, and this is the devil talking, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time, I repeat, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And let's go one more verse. Now that's twisted. That's not what is written. I wonder how many of you are, are uh, biblically literate enough to the point that you know what he changed. Because he's going to do it to you. That's why you have to live by every word of God. I'll explain in a moment. I want to go one more verse, though, before we stop. Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again. 
Now, I mean, they're having a great Bible discussion here. Christ and the devil. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so it is. But what was he talking about? First, let's analyze what Satan changed. Lest at any time, he said, Okay, turn with me, if you would, to Psalms 91. We're going to go over there. We're going to go where it is written. That's how, beloved, you put off and stave off temptation is by doing it as our Father showed us how to do it. If you were ever tempted to wish to, uh, if you were just to jump off of a high building and say, God, catch me, do you think he would? Of course not. If you're dumb enough to do that, you're too dumb to serve God in any way or fashion. So, now, Psalms 91, and verse 1, and it reads, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Where do you dwell if you dwell in the secret place? You dwell and abide with the Almighty. And when He is with you, then you don't have to worry about it. You're with Him. He is in you. And you don't have to worry about be, being tempted by Satan. Verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Do you? Is he your refuge? Is he your fortress? In other words, when you, what, what do you use a fortress for? If you're in trouble, you go into that fortress. And God will always protect you there. Uh, this, this is spoken in a spiritual sense, or preferably written in a spiritual sense. Three, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence or even temptation from the tempest. God will see. He will always give you a way out. But you've got to understand where you're abiding under the shadow of God. How do you do that? In His Word. Every word that came from His mouth. It strengthens you to the point whereby you don't have to worry about temptation. And I, I will add, there is not one of us in the flesh that does not bow to temptation occasionally. It happens, whether it be food or whatever the case might be. But he also gave us that escape in repentance through Jesus Christ uh, from the bottoms of our heart. Verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers. Consider our father as the great eagle mentioned in that great song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32. And under his wing shalt thou trust. You can always trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His truth is what? His truth is your weapons. His, shield, his truth is the shield that protects you from the fiery darts of Satan. Meaning what? Satan won't mess with you if you have the faith of Christ to be the protection between you and Satan. Satan knowing that you have power over him in that trust and because of that wing that is just over your head, the wing of God, the protection of God. This is what Satan was driving at. Go ahead, jump. It won't hurt you. You see, only an, only an imbecile would tempt God in the sense that he would want to put on some circus sideshow. Verse 5, God doesn't put on sideshows. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. You don't have to worry about anything. Nor for the arrow that flieth by day. You know that the hunter... When he hunts you in Satan's fiery darts, this is given in the sense of, uh, uh, again, spiritual. However, a person that understands God's word very clearly and understands the rights we have to protect ourselves under God's law, 
then you don't have to worry at night either. Verse 6, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. <clears throat> you see, the reason you don't have to worry about the pestilence of the nightfall or in the darkness, our Father, through His Word, gave us the right of self-protection, and He sent three. He sent certain brethren, uh, Brother Smith and Brother Weston, Weston, and um, um, they have a special miracle code. It's called 357 Jews, and when you use it fully, and then there was also Brother Winchester. He had 12 tribes, or I mean 12 gauges, that is the different, you know, with double aught was his real number. I mean, that really sprays the hallway, you know, when you know there's someone trying to harm your family. And do you know what the enemy does? He dissipates by these dear brethren that our Father so, so graciously sent among us that we don't have to fear in darkness, even in the physical sense, by using common sense. A word to the wise is sufficient. But at the same time, the majestic overall is that God protects his own. But not as Satan twisted it, and we'll explain it when we get to that part. Just be alert. Verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. What? The deception, Satan's deception. Many people will be deceived by Satan, and they're going to receive his lies right up here in their little old forehead, which is the mark of the beast. If you are so steeped in traditions of men today, you've already got it and don't know it. But you're so deceived about uh, what's uh, God's prophecy, every word that's written, that you've listened to a fairy tale that happened in 1830 and might think you're going to fly. Whereas God himself teaches on, from the word of God in Ezekiel um, chapter 13, I don't like those people that teach you to fly to save your soul. You'd think that most people would be wise enough that they could read God's word and put man's word in the trash if it disagreed with God's word. Uh, that's just a statement of fact, and any Christian should agree with it. Read Ezekiel 13. Begin with verse 18 when he talked about his own daughters, which is to say his bride-to-be. And see if you think with what's being taught you, you'll be one of his brides at the wedding feast. Verse 8, continuing. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. We're going to see it. They're, they're going to get what they've got coming to them. God always sees to that. You that have eyes to see, step over the rough spots. The wicked keep falling down. Verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. You dwell there. You dwell under the shadow of his wing. You have Christ in you, and when you have Christ in you, he is in the Father. We are one in him. That is to say, the um, Holy Spirit welding together those that take that refuge, that protection, that fortress into their hearts and minds bringing them wisdom to know how to be introduced to the good brethren that take care of us on earth, and then God takes care of that that we can't take care of. That keeps you well protected. But don't tempt God with foolish statements from Satan, all right? Verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. I mean, if you... If you go by God's health laws, you do it God's way, that's just about the way it is too, friend. And um, I, I thank our Father, and of course I'm getting along in years, but if the, if, um, if the medical community had to depend on me to support their habits, um, they would have gone broke a long time ago. Uh, because... Um, 
um, with me, it just doesn't happen. Um, and so, be that as it may, I just say that if you eat God's food the, the way you're supposed to, uh, you will always have health. Now, naturally, when as we grow older and the teeth grinding don't make quite as much noise and the birds don't sing as loud as they used to and so forth, well, then I suppose that's why we have the good medical people like Dr. Luke of the Gospel of Luke was. 11. For he shall give his angels, this is what Satan said to Christ, sharpen up for me, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now, did he say at any time? Didn't say that. Satan lied. That was like any time you want to do it, son. God will take care of you. That's not what it says. And there's a great difference. And that's why Satan will, will trick you if you're not familiar with the scripture, not at any time, but to keep thee in all thy ways. Verse 12, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. In other words, not at any time. You can't just jump off of a building and say, God, catch me. Won't happen. All right. So we see how that Satan can twist things. I hope you understand why Christ sent you to this place to understand. Because the best is yet coming here in another verse. Why that you take God's word rather than Satan's trickery and his deception. How that, that God is our habitation and our protection. You see, when he takes good care of you, he expects something from you. I mean, if you're all charged up and a can-do type soldier for God, then he didn't do it just so you can sit there and look pretty. He's got things for you to do. What? Verse 13. They shall tread upon the lion and adder. Do you know what an adder is? That's a serpent, a snake. Tread means stomp, kick. The young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under thy feet. In other words, we're taking names and kicking dragon. You got it? That's the way it works, friend. That's the way when you are armed with the truth, with every word of God, you don't have to worry about the dragon in the book of Revelation. All it is is the devil that tempted Christ, and he showed you how, even from Jerusalem, to defeat the destroyer, the dragon, the serpent, that old devil. I don't know why anyone would want to be tempted by him anyway. I would, if, if I were biblically illiterate, uh, I'm afraid that well, I'd probably do exactly what I did when I was in my early years. I would start studying God's Word, and I still like to study three or four hours a day. Of course, that's my business, and most of you can't afford to spend that much time in research. You mean you've been teaching God's Word 45 years and you still have to study? Absolutely. I learn something every day. Nobody knows it all. Um, it, um, if you find some per person that knows it all, it's very difficult to get along with them because you will find out quite uh, soon that probably they don't know anything. But uh, it is amazing. Taking names and kicking dragon with your feet, trample them, stomp them. He's talking about Satan or any of, in other words, that would come against you because why? We have power over them. Anything negative that comes in your life, that's why God's elect are can do type people. We're not second class citizens. We cut awake wherever we go. Because that's what children of God are supposed to be. Somebody. The amount of money you have in your bank has nothing to do with being somebody when you're a child of God. And you know it. And you are strengthened by His Word whereby you can protect yourself and your family and cast fear out the door. Can-do type people. Take names and kick dragon. That's what we're in the business of. Verse 14. 
because he hath set his love upon me. And naturally, you stomp him with love. And many men say, well, what do you mean stomp the devil with love? Well, you love your brethren, so you stomp the, the devil. All right, that's, that's, that's real love. Some might call it tough love, but that's where it comes from. Therefore will I deliver him. You don't have to worry. I will deliver him. You don't have to worry. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Do you know his name? His name is Yeshua. He is the living word, and this is that living word. Do you, are you familiar with it? It strengthens you. It keeps you from being tempted when you follow the instructions of the chief teacher, which is to say, Jesus Christ, as he set that example that you would not be tempted. Don't let Satan tempt you. You know better. You're too intelligent. As it is written also in that great book of Matthew, you're wiser than the serpent. Who wants to be no wiser than a dumb snake? For that's what he is, a snake in the grass. And if you can't outthink him by knowing when he twists your father's word a little bit that keeps you on the out of trouble, then I feel sorry for you. If you can't catch Satan in his own deception, no doubt. And it's really sad that no more of God's word is taught by the so-called churches today than what is. That the poor children of God starved like starving lambs, go to the trough to be fed, and the good pastor will never put any feed in the trough, but would rather talk about himself or some church system or social. Oh, well, I won't start on them, but it is sad. Many people think that I give people a hard time. Nobody but but preachers that claim to be preachers but never get around to preaching God's Word, maybe except for a verse or two here or there once a week. It's disgusting. God's Word is so powerful. It's no wonder that people are tempted to, to the degree that they are. Verse 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. If Satan were to call you, would you answer him? Do you know the difference between the first Messiah and the second? The in appearance, chronologically, as said in God's Word? I hope so. Otherwise, you're in trouble. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Whenever there's trouble, God's with you. Do you believe that? Do you have faith in it? If you have the faith, don't worry. As long as you do your best and take care, take care under the laws that he has given us of protection, you don't have to worry. Verse 16. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. His salvation brings you ever eternal life. Now, do you remember? Do you remember that Jesus said, don't tempt God? Well, we're going to go back to Deuteronomy 6 because he quoted that. As he said, it is also written. And in Deuteronomy 6, we have a nice little... Um, um, verse there. I want you to, I'm going to start with verse 13 and I want you to memorize it for a few moments. Just memorize it for a few moments. Can you do that? Many people can memorize something for a long period of time. All I'm asking is that you memorize this 13th verse for just a few moments because I'm going to call upon it and, and uh, will explain at that time why I ask. Verse 13, Thou shalt fear, this is Deuteronomy 6, from where Jesus quoted from Psalms 91, Deuteronomy 6, and Deuteronomy 8 in the temptations. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Now tuck that away in your mind. Verse 14, Ye shall not go after other gods. Have you got that? That means other ways of teaching, other ways of belief. You will not go after the spurious Messiah. You will not go after the, the uh, false shepherd. God doesn't like that. Why? For the gods of the people which are, uh, uh, rather, um, I'm going to reread 14. 
You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. Don't do it, friend. Well, and, and let me rest, let, rest assured of this, that other gods can be your business if you make it your god. Anything that is so paramount in your mind that it comes before your heavenly father that gives you everything you've got is an idol. It's another god to you. So you better wake up to that fact. It's important. God just so happens to want to come number one in your book because he created your soul for his pleasure. It's a good idea for you to bear that in mind if you want his blessings. How precious his word. Verse 15. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. He's right with you. Lest the anger of the Lord lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Blot it out. Blippo. And here it comes, verse 16. Ye shall not tempt, this is what Jesus quoted to Satan, ye shall... Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Masha. What happened at Masha? Incidentally, what does Masha mean in the Hebrew tongue? Temptation. It's important that you know about Masha. Check it out in the book of Exodus someday to carry it further. We're not going to have time in this lecture. But that's where they were also the town Mervah, which is chiding. God named it that. God had fed them in the wilderness with manna, food from heaven, had brought quail meat to them. I mean, it's like a bunch of little spoon-fed babies out there in the wilderness, and they started murmuring because they didn't have any water. There's something, we're going to die out here, and we had it good back in Egypt. Beats anything I've ever seen that a group of people that could have seen the sea open and to have been hand spoon fed and then still griping, moaning, and complaining. But that's what poor me babies do. Oh, God just doesn't do this for me. It's because you won't do anything. You're not a can do type person. You're a poor me baby when you fall into the category of that bunch at Masa. And God doesn't like it. God gives us the power. God gives us the authority. All souls belong to him. That includes you. And he teaches you how to do it. And then to sit and whine and murmur and complain when they could be an individual that could take names and kick dragons beats anything I've ever seen. I blame, I blame teachers for it because they will not feed the poor starving sheep the simplicity to avoid temptation when Christ set the very example for it when you carry the teaching out to its ultimate and we certainly haven't done that but at least we're carrying it farther than some. You need to go to Masa. I'm not, as I stated, time won't allow, but you do it. Find out what happened there and see what, and, and test God's emotions while you're there. Don't forget the verse I asked you to memorize. Still remember it? Good. You're going to need it here in a moment. I'm going to call on it because I don't want to go back to the Old Testament again for this moment. Go back to Matthew chapter 4 and let's pick it up in verse 8. Uh, you're, you remember we covered uh, 13 with this verse 7 when Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Okay, verse 8, going again. Uh, still remembering 13 now. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And remember, Satan was the prince of the world. All right? Nine. And he said unto him, 
all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Do you know why Jesus allowed Satan to say this? Because Satan's coming in, as it is written, as the spurious Messiah, prosperously and pl with plenty of everything. He's going to give. He's going to pay your mortgage. He's going to give. He's going to give away the world. He's going to make it so good, but he's going to insist that you worship him, that you think that he is Jesus in your mind. That's receiving the so-called mark in your forehead. That's where your brain is. God gave you a brain. He expects you to use it. He said, "That's what he told Jesus. Just if you know." All you got to do is worship me. I'll give you it all. Verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, and remember these words, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. The one I told you to memorize. You didn't have to really remember it because, see, I knew we were going to reread it in the New Testament. That's what the New Testament is, is coverage of the old. Showing you how not to be tempted. Showing you how to live a long life like the eternity, which is forever. Or you can choose to be blotted out. I don't know. It's up to you. Whichever you choose, it's fine with me. I'm only responsible for teaching this word. And bless your hearts, that's exactly what I'm going to do as long as God gives me the breath and the strength. 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Exactly as it was written. Bless their heart. God promised them they would take care of him. He promises you as it's written. In what is it? Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Your protecting angel has God's face at any time. All right? What more could you ask for than the word and its truth? There comes a time. Uh, we're going we're gonna to complete in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. There comes a time when you will be tempted. But when... When you have God's truth and the table is set before you of the actual food of God, Satan's stuff don't look so good. It doesn't tempt you. You find it sour, maggot infested, when other people just gobble it up at any time. Boy, now, you know, that's what you want to do. Start your church and get all these little slogans and say that's all you have to know. Just forget God's word. You don't have to know the book of Revelation. Because I'm one of these that teach you fly to save your soul, like it's written in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 20 and 23 and 24. I know God hates it, but I still teach it because it draws a crowd for an easy way out. The easy way out is to know God's Word. It can't be any easier when He does it all for us after you've done what you can do plus finding peace of mind and being somebody rather than a poor me baby. You really want to know about temptation? Listen to this. Chapter 3, great book of revelations to the church of Philadelphia, one of the only two churches Christ stated would overcome. He's unhappy with the rest of them and they won't be there. If your church is not teaching what the church of Smyrna taught in chapter 2, verse 8, and this church of Philadelphia, I can tell you right now, God's word says you're in the wrong house. What did they teach? Well, let's take the church of Philadelphia as an example. Does your church teach what is written here? Because Christ found no fault whatsoever. He found fault with all five of the others. That's really difficult to figure out, isn't it? Well, I think most children can get two out of five, all right? Doesn't, doesn't take, it's not too hard to find which ones he's pleased with. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, that's to say the scriptures, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. God's word opens truths in your mind that no man, no false religion can steal away from you because God's word is supreme. No tradition 
can even dent the Word of God. Verse 8, I know thy works. Well, I didn't, I didn't know we were supposed to work. I know thy works. If you want to be in a winning church, you better be. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. Hey, when you've got a little of God's strength, it'll bulldoze anything in this world, friend and has kept my word, have you, or are you steeped in traditions? Are you teaching from quarterlies and God only knows what else, or do you teach from God's word? Have kept my word, and has not denied my name. Nine, behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are of Judah is what it means, Eudas in the Greek. They claim to be of our brother Judah. It's talking about the Kenites, and boy, do they cause our brother Judah headaches. And are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Worshiping us because we're at the feet of Yeshua. Got it? Now, this is what we came here for. Listen carefully. Verse 10. Because... Thou hast kept. Do you want to be an overcomer? This is the because. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, his word, and had patience with it. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. In other words, when the spurious Messiah comes and hauls that one heifer off out of the field and she giggly says... It's time to fly. He's, you're going to know that that is the most abominable thing you've ever seen in your life, is to see him falling over the serpent. That's when we start kicking dragon, friend. I will deliver thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come up on all, A-L-L, -L, all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. All are, nobody's going anywhere, and all are going to be tried. The question is, do you know the difference between the Kenites and our brother Judah? Do you have the key to David? Do you understand the scriptures? This is serious stuff, beloved. It's so simple. You can escape the hour of temptation because aside from deception, there is no temptation to you. Why did he say an hour? Well, in understanding the remainder of the book of the revealing, is which is what revelation means, in chapter 17, it, it equates, or it is a figure of speech that means Satan will rule for one hour, and it won't be, he won't be tempting to you now or then. 11, behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast in your mind, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Do you know what that name is? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I don't know. Does he talk to your church that way? Does your church teach who the Kenites are? If they don't, friend, you're in trouble. Because you'll probably be one of the churches that end up blaming our brother Judah instead of the Kenites because you're, they're biblically illiterate. I'm not judging. That's a fact. Just a plain, straightforward fact. I detest... I, I, the, I suppose the reason I am so driven in teaching as much of God's scripture as I possibly can with the expensive time that is purchased to teach it that I don't feel man has enough to say that God's word isn't more important and that I care enough about the children of God that they be not deceived because the deception is right at our door. All right, bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please?